Hello, I'm Johnny Cohen, and in this brief presentation, I'm going to discuss some key points concerned with running quality control on genome-wide genotype data, which is a common first step in running a GWAS. I'm going to provide a theoretical overview, addressing the overarching reasons why we need to do QC, highlighting some common steps, and discussing a few pitfalls the data might throw up. I'm not going to talk about conducting imputation or GWAS analyses or secondary analyses, nor am I going to talk at great length about the process of genotyping and ensuring the quality of genotyping calls. I'll similarly not go into any deep code or maths. However, if you are starting to run your own QC and analyses, I recommend the PGC's Rickapilly automated pipeline as a starting point. There are also some simple scripts on my group's GitHub that may be useful as well. They follow a step-by-step -step process with code and explanations. We're currently updating this repository, so look out for some video tutorials there as well. So here is our starting point. I'll be using this graph on the top right several times through this talk. And this is a genotype calling graph with common homozygotes in blue, heterozygotes in green, and rare homozygotes in red. Hopefully your data will already have been put through an automated genotype calling pipeline. And if you're really lucky, an overworked and underappreciated bioinformatician might have done some manual recalling to ensure the quality of the data is as high as possible. But in point of fact, the data you'll be using won't be in this visual form, but rather as a numeric matrix like the one below with SNPs and individuals. This might be in the form of a Plink genotype file or its binary equivalent, or it's in some similar form that can be converted to the Plink format. And where we want to go is clean data with variants that are called in the majority of participants in your study and won't cause biases in downstream analyses. That should give a nice clean Manhattan pot from GWAS, like the one below, rather than the starry night effect of this poorly QC'd Manhattan plot above. However, something I'd like to emphasize across this talk is that QC is a data informed process and what works for one cohort won't necessarily be exactly right for another. Good QC requires the analyst to investigate and understand the data. Often the first step is to remove rare variants. And this is because we cannot be certain of variant calls. Consider the variants in the circle on the right. Are these outlying common homozygotes or are they heterozygotes? We cannot really tell because there aren't enough of them to form a recognizable cluster. Typically, we might want to exclude variants with a low minor allele count, for example, five. There are many excellent automated calling methods to increase the amount of certainty you have in these variants. But it's also worth noting that many analytical methods don't deal well with rare variants anyway. Again, the demands of your data determine your QC choices. It may be more useful for you to call rare variants even if you're uncertain of them, or you may wish to remove them and be absolutely certain of the variants that you retain. Next, we need to think about missing data. Genotyping is a biochemical process, and like all such processes, it goes wrong in some cases, and a call cannot be made. This can be a failure of the genotyping probe, or poor quality of DNA, or a host of other reasons. But such calls are unreliable, and they need to be removed. Missingness is best dealt with iteratively. To convince you of that, let's examine this example data. We want to keep only the participants, which are the rows in this example, with complete or near complete data on the eight variants we're examining, which here are shown in the columns. So we could remove everyone with fewer than seven SNPs, but when we do that, oh dear, we've obliterated our sample size. So instead, let's do things iteratively. So we'll remove the worst SNP again, variant seven goes, and then we remove the worst participant, bye bye Dave. Then we remove the next worst SNP, so that's SNP two. 
And now everyone has near complete data and we've retained nearly all of our cohort. So this was obviously a simple example. How does this look with real data? So here we have some real data and it's, it's pretty good data. Most variants are only missing in a small percentage of the cohort, but there are some that are missing in as much as 10% of the cohort. So let's do that iterative thing, removing variants missing in 10% of the individuals, and then individuals who have more than 10% missing variants, and then 9% and so on, down to 1%. When we do this, the data looks good. Nearly all of the variants are at 0% missing this, and those that aren't are present in at least 578 of the 582 possible participants. And we've lost around 25 participants for about 22 and a half thousand SNPs. But what if we didn't do the iterative thing and we just went straight for 99% complete data? So when we do that, the distribution of variants looks good again, arguably it looks even better, and we've retained an additional 16,000 variants. But we've lost another 40 participants, which is about 6% more of the original total than we lost with the iterative method. Typically, participants are more valuable than variants, which can be regained through imputation anyway. But this again is a data-driven decision. If coverage is more important than cohort size in your case, you might want to prioritize well-genotyped variants over individuals. So we've addressed rare variants where genotyping is uncertain, and missingness, where the data is unreliable. But sometimes calling is simply wrong, and again, there are many reasons that could be. We can identify some of these implausible genotype calls by using some simple population genetic theory. So from our observed genotypes, we can calculate the allele frequency at any biallelic SNP we've called. So here, the frequency of the A allele is twice the frequency of the AA calls, those are our common homozygotes in blue, plus the frequency of AB calls, our heterozygotes in green. And we can do the equivalent, as you see on the slide, for the frequency of the B allele. Knowing the frequency of the A and the B allele, we can use Hardy and Weinberg's calculation for how we expect alleles at a given frequency to be distributed into genotypes to generate an expectation for the genotypes we expect to observe at any given allele frequency. We can then compare how our observed genotypes, i.e. the blue, green, and red clusters, fit to that expectation. And we can test that using a chi-squared test. Now, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is an idealized mathematical abstraction. So there are lots of plausible ways it can be broken, most notably by evolutionary pressure. As a result, in case control data, it's typically best to assess it just in controls or to be less strict with defining violations of Hardy-Weinberg in cases. That said, in my experience, genotyping errors can produce very large violations of Hardy-Weinberg, so if you exclude the strongest violations, you tend to be removing the biggest genotyping errors. The previous steps have mostly focused on problematic variants, but samples can also be erroneous. One example is the potential for sample swaps, either through sample mislabeling in the lab or correctly entered data in phenotypic data. These are often quite hard to detect, but one way to detect at least some of these is to compare self-reported sex with X chromosome homozygosity, which is expected to differ between males and females. In particular, males have one X chromosome, they're what's known as hemizygous, so when you genotype them, they appear to be homozygous on all SNPs on the X chromosome. Females, on the other hand, have two X chromosomes, they are holozygous, and they have a normal X distribution centered around zero, which is the sample mean in this uh, case. You could also look at chromosome Y SNPs for the same reason. However, Y chromosome genotyping tends to be a bit sparse and is often not of fantastic quality. So 
there are benefits to using both of these methods. It's also worth noting that potential errors here are just that, potential. Where possible, it's useful to confirm these with further information. For example, if there isn't a distinction between self-reported sex and self-reported gender in your phenotype data, then known transgender individuals may be being removed unnecessarily. The aim here is to determine places where the phenotypic and genotypic data is discordant, as these may indicate a sample swap, and this might indicate that the genotype to phenotype relationship has been broken, and that data is no longer useful to you. Average variant homozygosity can also be applied across the genome, where this metric is sometimes referred to as the inbreeding coefficient. It's called that because high values of it can be caused by consanguinity, related individuals having children together, which increases the average homozygosity of the genome. There can also be other violations of expected homozygosity, so it's worth examining the distribution of values and investigating or excluding any outliers that you see. Examining genetic data also gives us the opportunity to assess the degree of relatedness between samples. For example, identical sets of variants imply duplicates or identical twins. 50% sharing implies a parent-offspring relationship or, or siblings. And those two things can be separated by examining how often both alleles of a variant are shared. Specifically, we would expect parents and offspring to always share one allele at each variant, whereas, whereas uh, siblings may share no alleles, they may share one allele, or they may share two alleles. Lower amounts of sharing imply uncles and aunts, and then cousins and grandparents, and so on down to more and more distant relationships. In some approaches to analysis, individuals are assumed to be unrelated. So the advice used to be to remove one member of each pair of related individuals. However, as mixed linear models have become more popular in GWAS and mixed linear models are able to retain and include related individuals in analyses, related individuals therefore should be retained if the exact analysis method isn't known. Again, it's worth having some phenotypic knowledge here. Unexpected relatives are a potential sign of sample switches and need to be examined, confirmed, and potentially removed if they are un truly unexpected. And once again, it's important to know your sample. The data shown in this graph does not, despite what the graph appears to suggest, come from a sample with a vast amount of cousins. Instead, it comes from one in which a minority of individuals were from a different ancestry, and that biases this metric. I'll talk a little more about that in just a moment. Relatedness can also be useful for detecting sample contamination. Contamination will result in a mixture of different DNAs being treated as a single sample, and this results in an overabundance of heterozygote calls. This in turn creates a signature pattern of low level relatedness between the contaminated sample and many other members of the cohort. These samples should be queried with the gene typing lab to confirm whether or not a contamination event has occurred and potentially be removed if an alternative explanation for this odd pattern of intersample relatedness can't be found. Finally, a word on genetic ancestry. Because of the way in which we have migrated across our history, there is a correlation between the geography of human populations and their genetics. This can be detected by running principal component analyses on genotype data pruned for linkage to sequilibrium. For example, this is the UK Biobank data. You can see subsets of individuals who cluster together and who share European ethnicities, other subsets who share African ethnicities, and subsets who share different Asian ethnicities. And in a more diverse cohort, you would be able to see other groupings as well. This kind of 2D plot isn't the best way of visualizing this. For example, here it isn't really possible to distinguish the South Asian and admixed American groupings, and you don't get the full sense of the dominance of European ancestry data in this cohort. 
the Europeans in this case account for around 95% of the full cohort, but because of overplotting, i.e. the same values being plotted on top of each other in this 2D plot, you don't really appreciate that. Looking across multiple principal components helps for that. Ancestry is important to QC. Many of the processes I've talked about rely on the groups being assessed fairly, being fairly homogeneous. As such, if your data is multi-ancestry, it's best to separate those ancestries out and rerun QC in each group separately. So that was a brief run through of some of the key things to think about when running QC. I hope I've got across the need to treat this as a data informed process and to be willing to rerun steps and adjust approaches to fit cohorts. Although we've got something resembling standard practice in genotype QC, I think there are still some unresolved questions. So get hold of some data, look online for guides and automated pipelines and enjoy your QC. Thank you very much for listening. I'm doing a Q&A at 9.30 EST. Otherwise, please feel free to throw questions at me on Twitter where I live or at the email address on screen, which I occasionally check. Thank you very much.